Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alexa Von Tobel, and this week, I'm excited for you to meet Divya Gokulnath, the co-founder of Baiju's, the world's largest edtech company. Divya co-founded Baiju in 2011 with her husband, Baiju Ravindran. She is among India's most influential entrepreneurs and possesses a unique vantage point of the future of learning. As a passionate leader, Divya's focus since the company's founding has been to create unique and personalized learning experience for students everywhere. Divya has played a key role in establishing and expanding Baiju's presence in the Indian market, guiding the company to become India's most valuable startup. Baiju's offerings reach 150 million students in over 100 countries, and educators regard the platform and its family of products as the gold standard in online and supplemental learning. Baiju's was named one of the 100 most influential companies by time in 2021, and Fortune has listed Divya as the number two on its world most powerful women in startups list. She is a Fortune 40 under 40 entrepreneur and among LinkedIn's top thought leaders in education. Beyond her work at Baiju's, Divya is a proud mother of two sons and enjoys indulging in her passion for singing. And with that, let's welcome Divya. I'm so thrilled to have you on today. I've obviously met your husband and the two of you came together and have built Baiju's into one of the most incredible education company on the planet. So let's go back to the beginning. What is Baiju's in your own words? Tell us a little bit about the origin story, but what's the purpose of the business? So for us, the purpose is very simple. It's We've stayed true to it for the last 15 years. The answer would be the same even 15 years from now. The mission is to create a world where every student can learn better. Now, this student, today we have we are fortunate to have 150 million students and working professionals across the world on our platform. But again, can I add even more value for them tomorrow? Can I go deeper? Can I go broader? Can I give them more choice? Can I put a student in the driver's seat? Can I make them self-learners and learners for life? Because an examination is just a path in your journey. It's not an end in itself. So when we started the company, we were very clear that what was missing in education was the love for learning. And we wanted to bring that back. Bring back the curiosity of a two-year-old, a three-year-old, where they ask so many questions. They want to know about the world around them. We want to bring that back in education. We want to bring that back in young adults. We want to bring that back in school-going children. We want to bring that back in adults, where they're reskilling, upskilling themselves, where they're learning because they want to learn, not because they have to learn. Can you just talk a little bit about what the status quo was that you wanted to disrupt? And as you said, you have over 150 million users. But let's go back to the status quo and let's talk a little bit about where you are today. Looking back, if someone would chart our journey, it probably looks like a series of very well-planned steps over time. But I should tell you, every day was as unknown to us as it could possibly be. Where we started in classrooms, which quickly filled up auditoriums purely by word of mouth. And then we were on to stadiums where there were 25,000 students who would attend a class at a time. And then we realized there was something very different about what we were doing. It was the content which was at the core of what we were offering. It was the different way in which we were teaching. It was because we were instilling confidence. We were teaching using common sense. Math is nothing but common sense. And we were able to help students understand that and do very well in STEM subjects like math and science. And then in 2015, after years of being in the offline world, we wanted to aspire to go to or we aspired to go from thousands to millions. And we said the only way we can do this is with technology. And so we took technology by our side. And in 2015, we launched our learning app. We had started creating content for five years before that, where from teaching in front of uh, students in a classroom, we would start teaching in front of a camera. Five teachers, including myself, would now bring concepts to life using technology, using a lot of in-air graphics and a lot of cool motion graphics and teach in very simple ways and very interactive ways. So we use technology for three things. One, to solve the problem of access. Two, to solve the problem of personalization. Today, classes have a one-size-fits-all approach. It runs at the pace of the fastest few or the slowest few. 
but that's not how it should be and finally to solve the problem that learning was driven by the fear of exams and not the love for learning and that we did by using technology to make content fun we created movie like videos game like interactions to make learning so visual the students would want to learn not just because they have to learn but because they love it and that's how we moved from a completely offline setup to a completely online setup in 2015 we stood out with the message of falling in love with learning which is very different and if you look at an asian country there is a lot of pressure on students to perform better it is always about marks and grades there was a lot of noise of rank holders and toppers and we stood out with the tone of falling in love with learning we've gone from apps to live learning in classrooms we've gone from a one uh, to one format to one to many formats we've gone from completely offline to completely online to hybrid centers in india we've launched 300 hybrid centers over the last one year so we have expanded across formats across geographies across grades across languages across subjects but today again like i said is day one for me i'm still raring to go and roaring to go talk a little bit about the personalization that byju is is leveraging and where that's trending what that's going to look like in your mind yes and today it's the hottest topic on how augmented uh, reality how artificial intelligence how generational ai can create an impact in education and it is slowly and steadily so even now as i speak to you i am at the asu gsv summit in san diego where the best education and edtech companies across the world are getting together and literally every conversation is about ai i also feel edtech is going to be the new ai and it's going to positively disrupt it now that being said i'm always wary of technology in terms of technology is good as long as you control it and it doesn't control you you need to be enabled by technology technology should not be enabled by you and speaking of personalization when we launched the app in 2015 we had a huge reception of the app and we had millions of downloads in just a few months and over the years with the millions of students who have been on our platform we have been able to train the app and various other platforms to adapt to every student's size style and pace of learning which means that if you and i would go through a journey say in a topic called sound and physics you would take a very different amount of time and i would take a very different amount of time and you would see very different videos and tests and so would i So you being the smarter student Alexa would probably finish the chapter in 15 minutes and I might take 30. But the important thing is that both of us would level up. So every student needs to get better. This product is not for toppers or rank holders only. It is for them, but it is also for every student who is learning today. And that's why personalization is extremely important because you would learn differently and I would learn differently. In fact we have some patented tools which we have developed over the last couple of years one of them is called badri b a d r i and it stands for hyper personalization and it does use guardrails around the content because see ultimately you're teaching children and you need to be sure that it's curriculum aligned you need to be sure of its accuracy but you also need to ensure that you're giving students what they need so personalization helps you and i would say hyper personalization for us has been possible because of the quantum of students who are on our platform but also because we've been intelligently training our platforms and systems continuously even as i speak today we have dedicated three labs just for innovation one in palo alto one in london and one in bangalore and the london one is dedicated to tomorrow which i think is very important because uh, like i started and i said the future of edtech is also ai Can you give us some of the biggest trends that you think are just obvious to you that are going to happen and how are you going to leverage AI to the fullest for education? One is the way in which we guide a student towards an answer. So if you give a child a question with four answers, the system should be able to understand why a student is picking a wrong answer. So say I'm speaking about the Pythagoras theorem. Now the child gives a wrong answer. You need to be able to understand is it because they do not even know that a triangle has three sides or is it a silly mistake? Now depending on the kind of answer they've chosen, the system is able to give them a hint which will help them understand the concept better. We call it a PTB approach where the B is the bottoms up. So you start by giving a pointed hint 
and then you go a little deeper so first you give a very superficial hint and just nudge the student a little bit now if they don't get it you go a little deeper the second time you give a hint which is stronger almost nudging them towards the answer in a different way using analogies right and finally if they still don't understand that is when you go bottoms up and then you give them and say why don't you think this could be the answer the point is you're not spoon feeding the child but you're giving them the level of understanding they need of a concept that will help them do better in the future because even students understand different concepts differently you could be very strong in a particular concept how do you bring the student up you do that by giving them hints solutions answers and nudging them slowly and imagine if you can train a machine to do that you can do this at scale because our curriculum is so vast if we fast forward you have this quote that i just think is beautiful you say we are at one of the most crucial points in the history of education when our classrooms are possibly about to change for the first time in a century what is obvious to you about this future of edtech you know we're going through this crucial point you see that the, what a classroom is is about to explode and really really be redefined there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen and that's what happened in education our classrooms changed for the first time in hundreds of years uh, students started taking the driver's seat we started integrating technology into the classroom what we saw in weeks was phenomenal literally every stakeholder started going online all of them started understanding that online learning is a part of mainstream learning now that being said i'm not saying that the future of learning is online the future of learning like the future of everything today be it the way we travel the way we live the way we work the way we teach the way we learn is blended it's hybrid the best of both the worlds online and offline now that being said what is the future where is edtech heading so if you ask me the future of edtech just like it's present will be about empowering students to become self directed lifelong learners who can adapt to a rapidly changing world and in order to achieve this goal edtech will continue to provide learners with the tools the resources the technology they need to take control of their own learning journey and therefore indirectly their destiny and i have to say that it's certain that the evolution of generative ai is going to create exciting use cases in edtech driven by the desire to create more personalized engaging learning experiences for students and as your ai algorithms become more sophisticated and capable of creating complex content we can expect to actually see a proliferation of ai powered tools and systems that will help edtech fulfill its aims of making education more accessible more personalized more engaging more intuitive more effective for every kind of learner. Talk a little bit about how you think COVID one what was COVID like for you as somebody who's running the largest education company on the planet. But two, talk a little bit about what you think we learned through COVID around education. So I started last by saying that you know there are decades when nothing happens and weeks when decades happen. And during COVID what we saw and the unfortunate situation was that of 1.5 billion students were actually out of school and what that has created even today is a learning gap now that learning gap needs to be bridged and note that i don't call it a learning loss a lot of people refer to this as a learning loss i would like to call it a learning gap because i'm very optimistic that with the right kind of resources we can bridge this gap what online learning did for students is that it gave them an opportunity to stay or continue learning and that is something that if we did not have this learning gap would have been even wider the un sustainability development report puts the learning loss they call it the learning loss of 20 years of gains in equity in education it's huge but the good news is there is a way to bridge it and let me tell you how So I'll start with the US perspective and then I'll speak to India. You know that we are today and fortunate to be the largest edtech company in the world serving the diverse needs of 150 million students and working professionals. The core of our mission is add more value to the student. Over 25% of our students are outside India. That figure is continuously growing. And we hear over and over again from educators, from parents, they say the classes, the products, they're helping them. They're helping their children love learning. They're helping them increase their learning outcomes. Let me give you an example of 
two of the subsidiaries that we have in the US. One is Osmo. Osmo was welcomed into the Baidu's family about three years back. It's grown four times hence. It's there in 4,000 US classrooms. It engages about two and a half million children globally. It's all about play-based learning. A new product launched by Osmo called Osmo Reading Adventure. So we have two reading products. One is Osmo Reading Adventure and the other is Epic. And I'm speaking about both of these because the reading scores have also dropped. Now, what this does, what Osmo Reading Adventure does is that it helps children read interactively. So we've shipped about 40,000 books to children's homes. So it's and after using Reading Adventure, we are seeing 82 percent increase in improvement in reading fluency. So the products are doing well. So we audit all of this. You know, Alexa, it's more about at that point in time, how do we provide students and parents what they need to solve for the particular situation? So reading, math, what are the kind of products that have we've seen have seen maximum traction? One is reading, one is math, one is English. These are the three and these are the core of early learning, which shapes and you know you have three young kids. You know that these are the three pillars or fundamentals on which your future learning is going to be based. Can you tell us a little bit how you've approached that build versus buy question? Talk a little bit about how you've done these acquisitions and how you think about build versus buy. For us, it's it's a matter of three parameters. It has to be a great product fit. It has to be a good business fit. And most importantly, it has to be a great team fit. For us, all of these three are extremely important before we choose to partner with a particular company. And I'm very happy to say, I would not say every acquisition has worked, but most of our acquisitions have worked. And that's a high success rate considering the normal success rate that nine out of 10 are destined to not work, apparently. That's the study uh, which was quoted to me. But we made them work, or at least so far. And how we've done it, I believe, is by trusting and understanding the power of compounding founder mentality. When you have more intelligent, like-minded, empowered individuals who are part of the same mission that you are, you not only get bigger, you get stronger, you get faster, you get better together. And that has worked. We've given them the freedom and flexibility and we've borrowed on each other's strengths. There are things that we have learned from them. There are things that they have learned from us. You know, people overrate this whole culture integration. I believe every company has its own culture and it should not be messed with. I believe that trying to bring everybody into your culture is not going to work. You need to let everyone run as per their own pace and style. But you need to bring the strengths together. And of course, you need to correct and help and support the teams as and when they lean on you for help and support. You have this quote that I love, which is that, you know, it's critical for entrepreneurs to move fast. And you describe it as a feeling that you are an elephant with wings because you're a very large company that is still flying. How have you navigated continuing to move very quickly while running such a massive company globally? I would not say it's been easy. It would be a lie. It's challenging every single day. There are hundred different turns to take and the bigger you are, the more difficult it is to navigate. But then you do. Why do you do that? You do that because as a founder, you're fixated on your mission, but you're flexible with your execution. Each and every day, you try to figure out a better way to do something. Someone asked me, what next for you? I said, I want to do what I'm doing today better tomorrow. And that's a simple goal for me. And that's how the goals should be. Today, we are in an era where we don't know what's going to happen two years, three years from now. So I am a big planner, but I also have weekly goals and daily goals. And that's what helps us stay grounded, stay focused, stay ahead. So like I said, it isn't easy, but it's challenging. And that's where the excitement is. Can you just give us an insight, Divya, in what you've learned about global expansion? And how have you thought about your playbook on expansion? Education is one segment, which is very universal. So if I have to put it in one line, for us, all our products are global products, but they're localized to every country and they're personalized to every learner. This basically means that when we are creating something for the first time, we always keep in mind the nuances that it's going to be scaled globally. This is going to be a product which is going to be far reaching, 
which will not just have to go broader but also go deeper that there are multiple languages cultural nuances that we have to look into so all of that right but this is something that we keep in our mind every time we create anything and we are aware that look we are not just creating micro we are also creating macro so having that sort of mindset is very important it starts with the founders mindset of understanding that you're global but you're also local local also is very diverse india is a country of 1.4 billion people and when you create for india you create for 1/6th of humanity and it's an extremely diverse country where at every turn you have the nuances of another country so that's been a big advantage for us creating for a diverse country like india the second is also what we touched upon in the previous question the question of build versus buy you know as we scaled globally we were often wondering you know what is the best way to tackle or advance in a particular market now there is one approach where you say look i know everything and i want to build but there's also the other approach of leaning on someone who understands distribution who understands marketing who understands the best product market fit and that's why our approach is always a combination of build versus buy so it's been build and buy and this is the second strong enabler for us the third is that we don't have any franchise model we own everything we create and we've created everything in house so all the products that you see are created by us this helps us have a complete control on quality because the only challenge at scale is how do you ensure that you're not compromising on quality when you're reaching millions of students across the world technology has helped us do that and having a great r&d team backed by 25000 teachers mostly women having that kind of pedagogy and i would say the sort of determination we have to ensure a uh, good pedagogy great pedagogy for students with the layer of interactivity and engagement around it has helped us scale and fortunately helped us scale with the same kind of quality across the world and we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors Divi, I want to transition a little bit just to you as a person. You grew up in India. Is there something that your parents did that left such a, a, a dent on you that you want to replay for your own children because it was such a good experience? I have two boys. I was the only child. I was troubling my parents for a sibling. If there's one thing that's probably played a big role in who I am today, it's the fact that my parents raised me not as a boy or a girl, but as a child. they gave me the same exposure they would give if i was a boy i played the same games i read the same books i went to the same libraries i had the same friends i was a sport enthusiast i was a music enthusiast i dabbled in the arts in the sciences in math all of that so i'm very fortunate to be in a family that brought me up as they should every family in the world like a child and not like a boy or a girl and that really helped for me my interest and my thrill in life is to be a good parent but also be able to be someone who can contribute to the economy and i'll have to look back at my family my upbringing to understand that it can be done you started your career as a teacher how do you think that made you an even better co-founder to buy you in building the business my biggest strength today is that i started as a teacher has played a strong role in who i am today You wouldn't believe it if I say that I was a big introvert in school. I wouldn't even imagine going on stage and speaking. And from that, addressing thousands of students, it's the other end. But then it's about picking up the challenges you have and building on them. Your strengths are anyway your strengths. How do you make yourself a better person by working on your weaknesses? And that's what I did. So over time, and I was always a performer, always interested in addressing, speaking, performing. So I've been a singer. Uh, all through my younger years but teaching was something that came to me naturally and byju someone who found that talent in me so it's not that i had great experience through my undergrad i was teaching my friends in college we would teach each other but right out of college byju asked me and i started as his student for learning math better he asked me why don't you teach it's not that i knew that i could but i guess he saw that i could and i went into my fl- first classroom the students loved it i loved it and i stayed back from a being a teacher to a leader to an entrepreneur which i think i started when i was 
you know today i realize it but then we were entrepreneurs we were plunging into the unknown you know we we've, we've been able to take that responsibility and i hope we can take the segment the industry the whole concept of better education forward what are your best planning tips to staying super organized give us one or two the first is the concept of creating artificial boundaries creation of artificial boundaries for me became extremely important during and after covid where i had my second child and i had to stay at home and work it was impossible i find it more difficult to work from home that you cannot cut yourself off completely and you need to focus you're running a company you need to focus it's not easy so one was learning and figuring out how to create that artificial boundary around myself so that i'm able to give my 100% the second and i think this is important especially for women we credit ourselves with multitasking but multitasking is what comes back and hits us i would rather give 100% to one thing at a time then try to do 10 things and give 10% to each all at once you have this quote that i just love which is valuations can vary but values are forever you are a deeply value driven founder where does that come from in you it comes from being the person who i am it comes from the upbringing i have the importance that was given to education both from a family perspective and a country perspective where we have the sound belief that education is not the best but the only way to make it big in life especially in aspirational and tier 2 and 3 districts in developing countries it comes from understanding the responsibility we have for 150 million learners for 50000 employees so valuations can actually come and go but what stays with you forever is the value you create and nothing and no one can change that i want to ask you four quick fire questions what is a book that you recommend to people that left a real dent on you charlie mackesy's the boy the mole the fox and the horse uh teaches you how to live without fear to live with your friends all for some cake i won't say it changed my life but it reinforced my belief that happiness is always a choice the second one is something that i'm sure a lot of people have read it's called the monk who sold his ferrari uh there is one particular line i absolutely love it says when you look outside you dream and when you look inside you awaken somehow that really really resonates with me tell us a question you like to ask when you're interviewing someone to get a sense of whether or not they are going to be a good fit for your team. So I would just ask them something like give them an example of a task and ask them how they would go about it. So if they would say that they involve themselves in the task then this person's an automatic fit because here we have a simple concept. Your leader has to work harder than you. The person who's leading you has to lead by example. I want to know the biggest pinch me moment to date at Baijus. 2013-14 where we booked an entire stadium of 25000 and we said we're going to fill this up with students we're going to fill this up with students who are going to learn math in a way they haven't learned it before until it was full i couldn't believe it and when it was full i couldn't believe it and the children would just give a standing ovation to a concept that they learned so differently it was like a math rock concert the second point pinch me moment is more recent I realized we've impacted five and a half million students who are learning from us for absolutely free from underserved parts of the country. Divya, last question. I want to know a quote that you live by, a quote that just has left a really big impact on you. One which really struck me was on inclusivity. You don't understand inclusion until you have been excluded. And the second is one that I heard yesterday which I thought was very interesting it's about bridges so there's a lot you can do with bridges you can build them you can bridge them you can cross them but you can also burn bridges so knowing which bridge to build which one to burn is very important because your decisions are going to have a huge impact Divya it is so clear you're just such a soulful human and that you and Baiju are just an incredible co-founding team I can't thank you enough for joining us today as a mother um as a student um of the world I'm so grateful for everything that you've done and to say we're rooting for you is quite literally an understatement everybody out there if you want to learn more please check out byjuice.com and you can join us next week for Ink the Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel Divya you are just a beacon of hope for the future really I'm so grateful
Thank you so much, Alexa. Thank you for having me.